Now let's work on the inner braces. These are totally optional, but with two young kids who spend as much time on the table as they do at the table, I want this thing to be as sturdy as possible. With the inner cleat clamped flush with the outside cleat, I can bring in the support stock and cut it to length. Now keep in mind, I'm using dominoes for this connection. Our plans assume that you don't have a domino and you can simply cut traditional mortise and tenon joints using techniques that were already shown in this video. With this special attachment for the domino, it makes quick work of mortising the end grain on these really small pieces, something I wouldn't even try to do with a router. That's why we recommend traditional integral mortise and tenon joints, or two dowels, as an alternative. Here I've got the two inner cleats clamped together with a small strip as a stop. I'll simply plunge both mortises by lining up the center lines. Now I'll mark the mortise locations on the rail. The inner cleats get a taper just like our legs and outer cleats. They also receive screw holes, a nice round over, and some sanding. Now we can glue the supports to the cleats. You don't really even need clamping pressure here, just make sure the support is perpendicular and the shoulder is tight against the cleat and let the glue dry. The rail gets a nice curve on the bottom edge, so we'll use a thin cutoff to draw it. Clamp two blocks onto the rail near the shoulders. Set them in from the edge about the thickness of the bending strip. Now play with the space so that the strip is flush at the outside corner. Place a mark one inch up at the center of the rail and bend the strip to that exact point. Now, we can simply draw in the curve. I'll work back to my line with the oscillating spindle sander. The final finessing is done with a flexible sanding strip, which is nothing more than a thin piece of plywood with sandpaper on one face. Now the rail gets the finishing treatment. Now it's time for those wedges. I'm starting with an 8 inch long piece that will taper from 5 eighths of an inch on one end to 3 eighths on the other. Looks like they're a little bit too wide. That's better. They should slide in easily. Now tap both ends in until the joint is secure. How far you trim them back is completely up to you. I want mine to be shorter than the width of the legs with a staggered arrangement. I'll give the wedges some soft, rounded ends using a roundover bit. It really doesn't take much pressure for the wedges to do their job. Man, that looks cool. So now let's move on to the tabletop. Now really a tabletop is just a giant panel glue up consisting of multiple boards. So you're gonna to want to flatten them and make sure that everything goes together nice and clean. But normally the jointing process on long boards like this actually consumes a ton of thickness. So it's really important that you find flat boards to begin with. And that means you won't have to joint them as much and you won't lose any more of the thickness than you absolutely have to. So since I have five quarter stock here, my goal is to end up with at least an inch in final thickness and I should have no problem getting there because, like I said, step one is picking out flat boards and I did a pretty good job of that. So when you're at the lumber dealer, take your time. I know they kind of give you funny looks when you do that, but try to take your time to pick out decent flat boards and you'll save yourself a whole lot of headaches when you get back to the shop. I'm not being too picky about the arrangement here. I'll just try to cut away as much sapwood as possible while arranging the grain in a way that looks good to my eye. The boards are cut a few inches oversized in length. At my current depth setting, each board takes about three to four passes to get one flat face, 
which still leaves me well over an inch in thickness. Now some of my edges are really out of shape, so what's the best way to joint them? I like to go with the smiley curve. By focusing pressure at the center, we can start to produce a flat reference area that eventually leads to a nice straight edge. Now we can plane the boards down. At this point, I honestly don't care what the actual thickness is. I'll just plane the boards until they all have a clean face. If that ends up above or below an inch, that's okay. And mine came in at just over an inch. At the table saw, I'll cut the boards down to remove any flaws. Once trimmed up, the total width should be a little bit over the target of 38 inches, leaving me some room to joint the table saw and edges. The jointer is set for the lightest cut possible at this point. Once again, I'll be using dominoes for alignment, but it's a totally optional step. Biscuits, dowels, or splines would work great here too. You can also use nothing at all and use some long calls to keep the glue up flat. Back in Arizona, there would be no way I could pull off this glue up all in one shot without using a long set glue like epoxy. But in Denver, it's a little cooler and there's a little bit more humidity right now, so if I work quickly, I can use regular old Type On 1. As you can see, I'm not worried about getting glue into the mortises. Some will end up in there anyway, but I'll insert the dominoes dry. I really don't need their strength. I'm just using them to keep the boards aligned and flat across the 38 inch width. In the interest of time, I'm only coating one edge of each joint. If I'm generous with the glue coverage, it should work out just fine. I find that parallel clamps can make a panel bow if you don't apply at least a few in the opposite orientation, so I add a couple extra to the panel just for balance. After the glue dries, mark out the overall 68 by 38 dimensions for reference. Next, mark in one inch at each end. Then use some scrap stock, or one of my favorite tools, a drawing bow, to draw on the desired curve. The curves are cut using the jigsaw with a good sharp blade. Stay just a bit outside of your line, just in case there's some tear out or blade wandering. The long sides are also given a curve that comes in one inch at each corner. I'll use a strip of scrap by clamping it in the center flush with the edge, then clamping the outside sections in by one inch. To refine the edge, there are a number of things that you can do. I like to use a rasp first to work back to my pencil line. Be sure to hold the rasp perfectly vertical so that you don't induce a taper. From there, I switch to a sander. Again, keeping the tool vertical is essential. The sander does do a good job of not only smoothing the edge, but making sure that there are no high or low spots. Once the curves are good to go, we can sand the panel itself to remove any glue residue from the glue up. Now it's time to add a nice round over. I'm using a tabletop roundover bit which has a nice elongated profile. And I'm actually putting this profile on the underside of the top. This should give the piece a lighter appearance and adds a detail that I personally find very appealing. Now I can give the tabletop a thorough sanding starting with 120 grit and working my way up to 220. You might notice that I always seem to have pencil marks on the surface. I use those to gauge when I'm done with the sanding on any particular grit. I sand the profile by hand. And make sure you sand with the grain when working on the ends. Now we can flip the table over and add a small round over to the top perimeter. Just enough to break the sharpness. And now we sand. Before the finishing starts, I'll lay down a blanket under the tabletop to help prevent getting any dings or scratches in the surface. 
So at this point, I've gone over the entire project with a little bit of 220 grit sandpaper just to make sure everything is absolutely perfect. And now we're ready to apply the finish. Nothing crazy here, just min wax, wipe on poly, satin formulation. I don't really like super high gloss, so I think satin looks a little bit better. About three to four coats is what we're gonna put on the base. For the top, I might put an extra coat or two because that's really the thing that's gonna get the most abuse. I've got two kids, they're very young, and we've got a long time to live with this table. So they're probably gonna beat the crap out of it. A little more protection would be good. Uh, the cool thing about the base is everything comes apart so none of this is glued together these things are so much easier to finish if we can actually finish them flat as opposed to surfaces like this meeting at right angles that makes things a little bit trickier and the finish quality is going to be a little bit better too so all right i'm going to get a secondary container pour this out and we'll start wiping on that finish the first coat will absorb readily so you don't need to be too careful about how you apply it just soak the surface with a brush or rag After the piece is well coated, go back and wipe off the excess with a clean rag or paper towel. The top is a little trickier since we can only work one face at a time. You could put it up on painter's pyramids, but with a top this heavy, it's likely to dent the wood. So I'll start with the bottoms first. I really want to build the coats quickly here, so I'll brush on the finish, but I won't wipe off the excess. After about six to eight hours, the bottom is dry enough to flip it over and apply a coat to the other face. All parts of the project receive two coats with no sanding in between. Once the second coat is dry, it's time to sand. The base parts are sanded by hand with 320 grit paper. By the way, you see all that white dust? That's exactly what you want. If your sandpaper is gumming up and you're getting little finish balls instead of dust, the finish just isn't cured enough. The top is a lot more fun to sand. I can use a 400 grit sanding pad on my random orbit sander to make the job a whole lot easier. All of this dust is bad for the finish, so I'll vacuum up what I can with a brush attachment on the shop vac. Using a shop towel soaked in mineral spirits, I'll give the parts a quick wipe down to make sure all the dust residue is gone. From here on out, all coats will be wiped on using a bundle of paper shop towels. Cotton cloth works better, but this is all I have at the moment. A quick tip to help save finish is to put some mineral spirits on the bundle to pre-soak it. Otherwise, it'll end up soaking up a bunch of finish that'll never see the wood and essentially it gets wasted. Now it's a simple matter of wiping on a consistent and even finish. Each pass should overlap the one before it by half. Continue to add finish to the bundle as needed in order to maintain a wet edge. After the top is completely coated, I'll go back around and coat the edges while also making sure that we don't have any drips that migrated to the other face. Of course, the top will take a lot longer than the rest of the project because I can only coat one side at a time. The base parts, however, can be completely coated in one shot. How many coats you do from here is totally up to you, but the process is the same every time. Personally, I like four to five coats. After the final coat cures, I like to finish the finish by buffing the surface with mineral oil and mineral spirits. The oil acts as a lubricant, while the 400 grit sanding pad gives the surface an even matte appearance and a smoothness that's unmatched. Of course, the sander works great on the top, but the rest of the parts have to be done by hand. and then clean off the oil with another rag soaked in mineral spirits. After the surface dries, I can buff off the haze with a dry rag and our finish is complete. Now for the final assembly of the base. Thanks to a suggestion from someone on Instagram or maybe Facebook, I can't remember, I decided not to glue in the center supports. 
they can still do their job without the glue, and now we have the added bonus of being able to flat pack this entire table. To attach the top to the base, I'll use Wood Whisperer thread taps. All we need to do is transfer the hole locations to the underside of the top, drill each hole about 5 eighths of an inch deep, then cut the threads with the tap. By the way, if you didn't hear, we do now have thread taps available for pre-order in metric. And now we can install the bolts. All right, so here it is. Uh, when not in use, we will probably push it until the feet contact the bench, which actually gives us tons of space over here, which is really, really nice. Uh, but the real test is what it's like to get in on that side, because I know that's what Nicole's gonna be worried about. All right, here we go. Yeah, baby. Really nice leg clearance. There's nothing to hit my knees on. Didn't have to move the table out, but I still have the table just a little bit over the front edge of the bench, which usually with the kids, that's where we want it. Mateo typically sits over here and we have to pull it back far enough so he doesn't kind of slip through and fall off the bench. Uh, if we wanted to, you could still pull it back a little bit further, but you don't really need to. I think there's pretty good. And right there, we still have easy access in and out, which is pretty sweet. So. I would say this was a success and only thing left to do is get it dirty and use it.